I've been working in this field for 30 years, and it hasn't been easy. It's been very difficult. I wrote the Transhuman Manifesto in 1983. I helped start the transhumanism movement with two other people, FM 2030, who is now in chronic suspension, and Max Moore. I met Max Moore in 1994. Uh, he is now my husband. We have a lot in common. He is the CEO of Alcor Life Extension Foundation. And I continue to work in transhumanism. I've seen ups and downs. I've seen people come and go. I've seen new organizations, old organizations. People come through using the term incorrectly. People coming through and criticizing it. For the first 20 years I spent working in transhumanism, I was an artist and I was criticized highly. In fact, I was more slammed than I was complimented. I've been on numerous television shows, interviewed by lots of different people, and in films. And usually it is about how ridiculous my ideas are about life extension and human enhancement. And the singularity, before Kurzweil even came up with the term singularity, which he borrowed from Werner Vinge. I interviewed Werner Vinge in early 1990. These ideas are not new. They've been around for a long time and far longer than me. We all stand on the shoulder of giants and thinkers. In fact, thinkers about life extension date back to the Taoists, BC, with the idea of immortality, which is a term I do not use because immortality seems to me like a play of Sotra, no exit. Immortalities are there, you can't get out. Rather, indefinite lifespan. Live as long as you want, choose when you want to die, or redefine the term of death, have new types of death. Showing you this video clip was a project I worked on four years ago. It never came to fruition because I had a different idea, something I thought was more important at the time. I'm a professor at a university, I'm a doctor, and my theory is of transhumanism and human enhancement. So I am an authority, but I don't know everything. I just know from firsthand experience what I know, and I learn continually from other people who help refine my knowledge. But it's consequential to each of, of us that we get our knowledge correctly, that we go directly to primary sources and then secondary sources. If there are people alive today who came up with ideas like artificial intelligence, or artificial general intelligence, nanotechnology, or nanomedicine, the singularity, let's go to those person. Let's give them credit for the hard work they did because they were in the trenches, much like I was, for many years, fighting the public and fighting the journalists who said we were stupid science fiction, um, no-nonsense pinheads. So today, transhumanism has grown by leaps and bounds. Thank goodness to so many different people and so many different groups. I'm grateful to you all, each one of you who has contributed and those of you who are yet to contribute to this wonderful movement because the movement is about humanity. It's about our lives. So why am I talking about transhumanism as an iterative design process? Because that's what design is. Design is all about problem solving. I changed my work from being a performer in Hollywood to uh, from an artist performer to a designer after I had an experience and I was telling someone about it um, in the audience today and, and um, someone came up and thanked me so I thought I would share it. I was pregnant, living in Japan, working. Uh, I had a career there and my baby died and I almost died with the baby. And I realized then the fragility, the vulnerability of the human body that we may think about how we look on the outside, we're our latest fashion or our latest style if we're a geek or if we're a Versace fanatic. But we don't know what's going on inside our bodies. Thank goodness for all the apps and the advances in technology and medical technology that allow us to now learn a little bit about what's going on in our body. So my body has always been my artwork. Um, an iterative challenge I'll talk about in just a moment. But I wanted you to see what I had been working on, this TV show, because I had a TV show in Los Angeles for, I think it was, gosh, 10 years. It was the first TV show on the future and transhumanism in 1986. I started it. It's called Transhuman Update. Then that didn't do so well. Transcentury Update did much better. <laughs> no one knew what transhuman was. OK, so design is a field that I've become extremely immersed in over the past 15 years because it allows me the opportunity to look at how to solve problems. Buckminster Fuller was my main influence, Susan Sontag and Lynn Margulies. Lynn Margulies as a biologist because she had a difference of opinion to Darwin. 
in her view, in her estimation, humans evolved from a conglomeration of bacteria and intelligence formed, of course, through our frontal lobe, et cetera, but that we evolved as a, con a conglomeration of different types of organisms that form together. And if we do merge with artificial general intelligence and further with machines and technologies, it very may well be that we can see this type of future where we are a multiplicitous, diverse conglomeration of ideas and matter. Okay, so let's go on to my first slide here. Uh, uh, uh. Yeah, down. One, two, <laughs> sorry. Ah, David. Okay, okay, so I use Paige. Okay. <laughs> hey! No, no, that's good. No, how I did, yeah, like that. <laughs> okay, the goal is to explore strategic yet instinctive behaviors in navigating new ways of understanding life, death, identity, intelligence, consciousness, and the many challenges that await us. Okay, what's the main issue we're dealing with? Life and death. We still are arguing what is life. We're still evolving and determining when is death. The very notion of when we die is up for grabs. We used to think someone was dead when their heart stopped or we couldn't find moisture on a mirror when we put it up to the nostrils. And then we've developed new technologies, new tools over time to not only prolong life, but to redefine what it means to be dead. And that's where transhumanism comes in because the option here is why not redefine death? Why not have optional death? So let's take a look at that. If design is a marvelous tool for us to consider um, the iterative process, then we're always redefining transhumanism in its possibilities, but not the core values. The core values of transhumanism must stay constant. It must be about critical thinking, visionary thinking, and to use technology to help resolve various conflicts that we face. The most predominant is our health, our well-being, staying alive. So we do everything we can to stay alive. And we'll do everything we possibly can to help our loved ones stay alive. But when it comes to living beyond 122 to 123 years, our maximum lifespan, then we get a little bit fuzzy there. Some of us want to proceed ahead and become transhuman, others not. Why not give it up to choice? Those who want to live longer, that's their choice. Those who don't, I think there's a gentleman in the audience who said he did not, that's his choice. So more diversity, more multiplicity, more choice, more freedom. Lynn Margulis, I wanna bring a woman up today. So Lynn Margulis, hooray for you. Um, when we think about our body, we take a look at the outside of our body and we're wearing all sorts of apps on our bodies to determine what could feasibly be going on inside of our bodies. But we also have MRIs and FRM, fMRIs to take a look in our bodies. So in my research in looking inside my body, I took a look at, of course I did 23andMe. Does everyone, everyone's done 23andMe? Yeah, 23andMe, well the FDA closed it down for a while but there's, um, going to be some challenges there. 23andMe, it costs $99 to have your genes, uh, not quite sequenced, but to find out what types of diseases you could have a propensity for, like Alzheimer's, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, ALS, et cetera. So looking inside your body and finding out is a very good start. In uh, my work, I used my body to find out I had degenerative bone loss, so that's called Osteopenia, later in years it's osteoporosis. So I fought that and survived that. Um, exercise, anaerobic, aerobic exercise, eating the proper foods, um, doing the proper things. But it's not just that, it's more about, oh, I'm gonna screw up again here, sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, our identity and our person. We talked about identity a little bit here. What is AGI, what are we going to enhance with, who are we, our consciousness? Well, the metabrain is a term that I've used for many, many years about augmenting the human brain. And I've worked with a number of different specialists in artificial intelligence, Marvin Minsky uh, primarily, um, to look at if we were to design a future human, how would we design our intelligence? What would we use artificial intelligence for? Well, that's of course 
uh, gone through a very long, cold winter. So artificial general intelligence became the new term bottom-up intelligence. Rather than neural networks, we learn like a child, and the AGI or AI would learn like a child in general intelligence. So rather than it being something other, as we've heard speakers talk about, something that we might fight in the future that would cause a drastic singularity, and again, the term singularity is a misnomer in, other, in and of itself, that we would become smarter ourselves. We would continue implementing our brains so that we have better cognitive awareness, and the AGI could, in fact, become like a best friend to us. <coughs> singularity, let's clear that term up right away. The singularity was coined by Werner Vinci. Damien Broderick wrote the first book about, explicitly about the singularity. Um, I interviewed Werner Vinci in the late 1980s on the singularity. He said it was a sharp curve and a wall. Once we hit the wall, life would never be the same afterwards. That hitting that wall would change humanity forever. Now we have various theories about the singularity. And the most appropriate one, I find, is not Ray Kurzweil's um, acceleration, but that of the surge, surges like waves. Things happen, then they slow down. Then they happen very quickly and slow down. And that's how life is, is it not? So it makes more sense that we would advance in the future if and when superintelligence outperforms human level intelligence, that it would happen in surges. And it could happen when we least expect. The film Her is a perfect example of a type of singularity scenario. If you've seen that film, which I think most of you have. So going ahead here, the brain. Thinking about enhancing the brain, that's my brain, by the way. Uh, don't look at the white stuff, that means it's not good. <laughs> There's only a little bit of white for my age, so I'm very happy about that. But when we look at the brain and enhancing the brain, we uh, listened to a speaker talk about the ability of maybe enhancing the uh, frontal lobe with certain types of <coughs> electrodes and intentions and rhythms and suppositions. And there's all sorts of new augmentations for the brain to learn more about neuroscience and cognitive science. But the main issue of the brain is our memory. If we talk about identity, it's our memory who performs ourselves. The continuity of identity over time, the dichotomy of self, is what we need to think about protecting. So if we were to back up our memory, back up our brain, that would be very helpful for us, would it not? I mean, if you have an accident, or you're in a coma, or something happens, hopefully not, you would want to preserve your memories, have access to them. So it's really a ridiculous notion to think that we back up our computer all the time but we don't back up our brains. <laughs> and if we could back up our brains, then what? Would it be 24-7, nonstop backing up? Where would it go? Would it go to a cloud? Ooh, that's kind of scary, because someone could hack the cloud. So these are issues that we need to talk about when we're thinking about uploading and backing up the brain. And Randall Cohen is certainly involved in that field, as well as <laughs> Andrew Sandberg and a number of other dear friends. It's a very important field. But most importantly about it is, what are we doing now? And we talk about transhumanism. What goals are we doing now? Let's not be so hypothetical about the far future. Let's think about what we can do now about the brain. That's an issue. Our memory is an issue. Let's see if I get this right, finally. No, no, no. OK, here we go, death. We talked about death a little bit. But let's really think about death. Why do we have this ultimate death, OK? There used to be two sexes, male, female. Well, that's not true anymore, is it? We can be bisexual, cross-sexual, transsexual, intersexual, you know, all new types of asexual, et cetera. What about jobs? Do you have the same job you had 20 years ago? I've changed my career many times, and I hope that I'll change it again. I love being a professor now and an author, but I don't know what I'll be 10 years from now. So we don't only have one type of job now, so that's two. Three, are you in the same relationship that you were 10, 20 years ago? Some of <coughs> us are. Some of us have been divorced once, twice. Sometimes we change partners. Sometimes we have multiple partners. So the whole idea of sexuality and being in a relationship has changed. It's no longer considered, oh, why she's divorced, why he's divorced. It's no longer considered such a terrible thing to get divorced. In fact, you could have a wonderful marriage 
and then outgrow each other or just have a difference in life and you meet someone else. This is fine, so there should never be a failure with a divorce, unless you involve with someone who's a bit angry, <laughs> difficult to get along to. Okay, so we need more tools and techniques to determine if a person can be revived from death. Okay, this is the issue. We've had life or death, one or the other. There's been no in-between, right, unless you're in a, a coma. And if you're in a coma, if you're brain dead, then your family will fight while the body's still working, it's usually on a machine. Or if your brain's still working and your body's not working, then uh, you know, what are you gonna do? That's kind of a very unfortunate situation. And thank goodness, prosthetics, robotic prosthetics and AI-driven prosthetics is making great strides, beautiful designer strides. But we need to redefine death, what it is and determine if we want to look at it in a multiple level of ways. So this in of itself is one of the most important aspects of transhumanism today. In fact, every field today, it's not just science, it's not just medicine, it's all fields, it's transdisciplinary and it's cross-disciplinary, and we all need to work on thinking about that. Okay, Lazarus. Tools. Tools currently used to reverse death or include the autopost portable CPR machine that keeps the heart beating and the extracorporeal membrane oxygen ECMO, artificial lung that keeps oxygen blood flowing. This is happening. So we're keeping people alive on certain types of machines that would never ever be considered. We looked at a bridge of what, a couple of hundred years ago, I can't remember when it was, but that bridge was an example of how things can change within 100 years. And when we're talking about anticipating 2025, when you think about it by foresight and forecasting, that's not far away. So what next? The body. OK, so we have the brain. We need to back it up. We need to be more aware of our brain. We need to think about our mind, think about our memories, our identity over time, who we are. That's worth protecting. We also need to think about our body, being healthy, looking inside of it, being more aware about our own health because anything can happen at any time. <laughs> Proof and evidence. And I've had cancer twice, and I've survived at both times. So things happen. We need to be aware and be proactive with our doctors. So we need to have a quantified body, a qualified life, external perceptions, internal awareness to keep alive, stay alive. That's the name of the game, stay alive and sign up for Cryonix, for goodness sakes. Okay, so thinking about signing up for Cryonix, where does that take us next? A major challenge for me. I designed uh, Primo Posthuman in 1997 as a first future body prototype, a whole body prototype, thinking very deeply and sadly about people I knew who were quadriplegics and paraplegics, and I have two good friends who died from ALS and MS. And my concern was for their bodies. Of course, their brains were deteriorating as well. But I thought if we could have an alternative body, that might be very helpful. And since the advances in prosthetics with robotics and artificial intelligence and haptics and neural interfaces are advancing so rapidly, it makes sense that we could have a whole body prosthetic at some point. So where do I go with design with this? Thinking about my own body and my own experiences is a first step. Now this is part of the quantified self movement where I worked on my own project in quantifying my body. But the bigger challenge for me as a designer is not just that. The challenge is to look outside my designated field as a designer and a soft scientist to where I could work on something that would take it to the next step. To take my educational TV shows, to my documentaries, to uh, my design and, and coming up with this concept of the future body, to what could be worked on today that could make a difference. Okay, now I'm gonna tell you about my latest challenge. So, <coughs> observing the body, observing transhumanism, observing the possible redefining of death, thinking about the fragility and vulnerability of life, I thought there was one thing I could do that no one has done yet. The um, issue here is the C. elegant. C. elegant are nematodes. They're tiny microscopic worms that live in the dirt and they've been used more than any other organism for life extension purposes. In fact, they were the first organism to have their whole genome sequenced. The uh, C. elegant has is two sexes, hermaphrodite or hermaphrodite male. Male are very infrequent. They're mostly hermaphrodites. Uh, my idea was not original. Uh, some people had thought about it, but no one had done it 
So I got a grant after applying for a couple of times. I finally did get a grant. And I'm working with this worm here called the C. elegans. My project is to test this worm, the physiology of it. Pretty simple. It's a transparent worm. You just need a really good microscope to train it to perform a task. Not easy, but can be done. There's three different protocols, maybe four different protocols that I know of that worms can be trained to do, perform, repeatedly, scientifically proven. To vitrify the worm in liquid nitrogen using a cryotop methodology, there's several different methods. I chose cryotop because the cryotop method is used for freezing embryos. Successful, right? Very good method, following scientific protocol that is known to work and be respected. And then to test the memory to see if it remembers after cryonics. So the issue here is the best safety net we have today to stay alive, if that's the goal, is to be healthy, know what's going on inside of your body, be clear with your mind, know yourself, live well, enjoy life, be happy, of course, solve your problems, think like a designer. There's always going to be problems. It's how we deal with them that makes a difference in our lives. Challenge yourself. Try something new. Try something that no one else has done before or has done and do it differently. Bring it into the transhumanist scope. Try to show something that could at least do something so that we're not saying, oh, they're always theoreticals, always theorizing, always supposition, always conjecture. This is an experiment that, if successful, will make scientific history because it hasn't been done yet. Now, can it be done? Uh, from my work over the past two weeks in the lab with my research assistant, uh, looks good, looks very good. In fact, we're continuing with it. We're getting another grant for it. So what does this mean? This means that the whole <laughs> idea of cryonics as being um, not fuzzy logic, but bad logic, or you know, crystallization of the cells, if someone's reanimated or revived from cryonics, that he or she will not be the same person, your brain will be mush, it's a bad idea. I want to disprove that because it's the best solution we have today for staying alive. Anything can happen at any time. And from my firsthand experience, which I wasn't going to share, but I did because I was asked to, life is fragile. You could be at the top of your career, happier than ever, wonderful life, and walk outside and be hit by a truck, find out that you're a third, third degree uh, cancer, um, pregnant and not knowing it with an etopic pregnancy, which is life-threatening. Anything can happen. The best safety net you all have today is to sign up for cryonics. The technology <coughs> is around the corner. It's nanomedicine, of course. Uh, nanomedicine, which was um, Robert Friedis is the name there to remember with nanomedicine. He wrote the first and second book on it, so he deserves that credit. He worked very hard on thinking about cryonics and nanomedicine. Little machines going in the body and cleaning up cells, it can and will be done. We know this is happening. So I just want to let you know that there is a transhumanist here that's working on a viable scientific project that is designed. It looks hopeful. And I'm hopeful for you all that you engage in your projects, too. And don't think that it is impossible because it's not your background. I am not a hardcore scientist. I'm a designer. But anything is possible. Figure it out. Enjoy your lives. Thank you. Yeah. Oh. oh, does <laughs> does anyone have any questions for me? <laughs> yes. Sorry. Hi there. I'm really impressed with your experiment, by the way. I'd love to talk to you about it more. But um, I'm amazed that you can cryopreserve the worm and then revive it, and then it's still alive. I was just wondering, have you tried this on any other animals or, or uh, other creatures? Uh, the C. elegans has been known in science to have been vitrified and revived. It's, it's scientific facts. So that the best way when you're working on a new science project is to use qualified papers, research that's already been proven, documented, written up. So yes, the um, C. elegans has been vitrified uh, many, many times, and I've vitrified them many times, and they are 
they're pretty healthy afterwards. You tell if it's healthy if it moves beautifully. It's, I, I have a film and I didn't have time to show it. It's just an exquisite animal. It's transparent, you can see all the neurons in it, um, and it moves like a dance. If, if it starts jerking, then it's unhappy. But yes, it's, it's possible to do, and it's not a problem. Thanks, Natasha. What's the current cost of an Alcor cryonic suspension? Oh, uh, gosh. I have no idea, but I know I signed up in 1991, and it was 45,000 for a neuro. And I'm a neuro because I want to build a new body. I mean, if I'm going to live life on this body, I'm what, what, what's a neuro? I mean, I like it fine, and I work out a lot. But come on, I want to be six feet tall, <laughs> and I want to be dark skinned So, <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Okay. Thank. You. Oh, yes. Um, you spoke about uh, um, the need for more corporations and innovative startups. Um, you know, very um, I'm also quite encouraged by you, your um, encouraging people to to reach out and to develop themselves. Um, I just wanted to reiterate that and to say that you know each person can not just look at the networks that they've got, but also look at and say, look at themselves and their opportunities and perhaps say, okay, even if I can't actually work in an area. I can perhaps do the best I can to uh, to, 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 to generate extra, extra donations by encouraging yeah. others. I mean, ideas are precious. You've got an idea, find people who are experts in it and team up with them. Just make sure they don't steal your idea and leave you in the dust. <laughs> that can happen. Right. Uh, yes, back there. Oh, how important do I think money is in this area? Uh, I come from an artist background. You know, I never wanted to be rich. I want to be famous like all artists, but never rich. I never even thought about it. <laughs> I, dreamt, I dreamt for the wrong thing. Um, I'm not like Aubrey where I say I need millions and millions of dollars. I don't think we need millions and millions of dollars. I just think we need the right attitude, the right behavior, and a positive grassroots culture that wants it. And the money will follow. You know, it's kind of like, do it, create it, and people will come. The money will come if it's there. Thanks, Natasha. I really enjoyed your talk. Double-edged question because I've got the mic. So one question is, has anybody ever come back from being dead from the cryonics? That's no. number one. No. Number two, do the governments actually study the implications of inheritance or taxes for somebody who would be put themselves under cryonics? Well, you're put in chronics with, a, usually it's a life insurance policy. The younger you are, the less expensive it is. Like if you're under 30 or 40, it's $20 a month. Something, it's some ridiculously low price. If you're older, like me, over 60, get over 64, 65, then it's more expensive. So you want to sign up early. Okay, if you're going, I everyone needs a living will, everyone needs a will. If you don't have your finances in place, it doesn't matter if you're crying. I mean, if you're gonna sign up for chronics, you, you're a smart thinker in the first place. So if you're a smart thinker, you've got your finances in charge. So a living will, your will is your will. But how long fast forward Well, you know, it's interesting. Some people have invested their money in, what's that country uh, li uh, um, where? Luxembourg. Luxembourg, yes. Um, there are crowns who have bank accounts in Luxembourg, and it can stay there to perpetuity. So you want to just invest wisely. Question over here? Yes. Uh, I, I was wondering, be, uh, um, since you are like this super veteran of transhumanism, so to speak, are there any ideas? I mean, many of the ideas that people in this room are sort of taking for granted are really strange to people who have never heard them before. Are there any ideas in transhumanism today that you've seen that even transhumanists are like skeptical about that it's yes, too hard definitely. to believe transhumanism is based in large part on critical thinking um, so instead of you know Pollyanna future you know rose colored glasses the thing is to think critically about it and assess it you know use all the basic tools and rational thinking and, and logic um, as well as being a visionary thinker uh, there are ideas today which, no, I don't agree with. I don't agree with Raymond Kurzweil's uh, singularity. I don't think that we should be predicting the future. I think we should be forecasting the future. Um, 
I think that uh, Eliezer Yukowski's friendly AI is a wrong term. I think it should be benevolent or um, empathic AI. Friendly, anyone could be friendly. You know, the person sitting next to you could be friendly, then, you know, not a nice person. So I think that some of these ideas are a little bit off. The singularitarians, I'm not too into that because it's, it's pretty um, much based on IQ, how smart are you? And I've never valued that. I think some of the wisest persons, people don't have the highest IQ. I think um, life experience accounts for more than anything. So but that's my personal view. Um, other than that, uh, C setting is not really a transhumanist thing. That's um, uh, Petri um, Friedman. Friedman's particular idea, but you know, it's fine. Um, Time for two quick questions, one there and one here. Should I worry about missing neurons in the rest of my body if I only freeze my head? Should you worry about missing the other parts of your body? About neurons, like about your spine oh, and yeah. neurons uh, elsewhere. There's a question about the human connectome. We know that the Ciela gun is a connectome cause, because it doesn't have a brain. It's 302 approximately neurons are throughout its entire body. So our brain is in our, you know, in our head. <laughs> so Perception is very important, our senses are very important. That's why I do have a problem with the post-humanist agenda or the post-modernist agenda about the post-human uploading, saying, oh, transhumanists just want to upload their brain into the cybersphere. No, that's not true. We have to have a body. And I will argue to the redefinition of death on that. We have to have a body because you, you have to be in some kind of envelope. It may not look like this body, but it's still going to have a system you know, thinking about systems, uh, like in cybernetic systems, you have to have a system. That will be inclusive of perception, your feelings, your emotions, your awareness of the world around you through computational matter. Last question. Sorry. Hi. Um, I like your perspective, the, or you're a designer in this field. And I was wondering if you, I mean, I think some of the ideas are really like crazy, as you said, to people outside of the field. And if you ever speak to fellow designers, because maybe they, if you got a whole group of designers together, you would really see some movement in different types of ideas coming into the field. <coughs> uh, yeah, uh, y'all know who Bruce Mao is? Bruce Mao is one of the uh, world's leading designers. He's in Toronto, Canada. He created a project called Massive Change. And it's been in museums around the world. Just absolutely brilliant work. Um, he and I were at um, some place in Boston, the World Trade Center, giving a talk. He was the keynote. and. We were talking about design, and he said, I heard that the term transhumanism, um, was it Fukuyama or Cass? I can't remember, said it was the world's most dangerous idea. He said, good. <laughs> so even though he didn't know what transhumanism was, he loved the fact that, that the rigidity of thinking thought it was the world's most dangerous idea. I'll jump <laughs> off the stage here. But um, designers, by and large, are problem solvers. We want to pro solve problems. So designers are product designers, commercial designers, architects, et cetera. And no, there is a gap there. There's not that many transhumanists. You know, I don't have that many people to talk about. But when I talk about you know, building bodies and all prosthetics, then everyone loves it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for asking. Many thanks, uh, <laughs> Natasha. That's really great.